This is Overture, the Prelude Podcast. Welcome to Overture, the Prelude Podcast. My name is Christopher Willis, and I'm a principal security researcher here at Prelude. Hi, I'm Alex Manners. I am a principal cybersecurity engineer here at Prelude. And today, we have a special guest, our CTO, David Hunt. Hi, guys. Thanks for inviting me on the podcast today. Um, So yeah, I'm David Hunt. I'm the CTO here at Prelude Research. I come from kind of a varied background of private and public offensive security work. Worked at organizations like FireEye, where I managed the threat intelligence engineering department. Worked at places like Rockwell Collins, doing offensive security, Kenna Security, small companies, big companies, kind of bounce around. Uh, Worked in consulting for the IC for a number of years early in my career as well. And most recently, before Prelude, I worked at MITRE Corporation in Washington, D.C., which is actually where Alex and I met as we were two of the original developers on Caldera version 2.0. And so we met at MITRE and really kick-started our relationship and kind of our passion for doing this type of offensive security work for good and getting it out into the the public and and having more of a public face on on the public interest and so forth. And so my background really comes down to a mixture of offensive security work combined with traditional software engineering, which is one of the things that has really attracted me to technology like Prelude Operator which is our ability to combine forces on good software engineering, good off- offensive security, and creating a command and control center that is both a product as well as a hacking tool that is like none other. And I think that's a, a really exciting thing for me. It was exciting when we were building Caldera, and I think it's you know even more exciting now in Prelude Operator as we get the chance to essentially create a productionized version of the stuff Alex and I have always wanted to do. Yeah, and actually, that's uh, on our agenda for today. Uh, David, David, and I are going to be talking a little bit about the uh, engineering philosophies that we have here, and I guess some of the resources that we we like to always look back on as we're considering how we are tackling our problems and building the solutions for our customers. Yeah, so that's probably a good segue to uh, start talking about some of the new stuff we have in Operator One Point Three, which is the headless mode. Um, David. I know you've been working a lot on that. Uh, yes, I have been heads down. You guys probably haven't seen me much the last two yeah. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've got headless mode. I mean, I've got uh, really Alex, you, you to thank for getting us bootstrapped on that. So Alex actually did probably the most work getting just headless mode um, extracted out of core operator and into a compiled binary that we can actually work off of. So I'm actually going to pass it over to you, Alex, before we're talking about some of the team stuff, but like, what was your experience like getting operator like as a desktop Electron app into a compiled, you know, Node.js server side app? Yeah, well, it was a lot of working backwards, we'll call it. Um, when we first built operator as a team, we we didn't really have in mind that we were going to be separating out the API from the rest of it. And honestly, we didn't even have an API when we started. Um, that was definitely something that we evolved to um, out of necessity, but also out of simplicity. So after we got that API in place, the, I would say the hardest part was just ripping out all the like squirrely electron hooks that we had all, all nested into these deep modules that we had across our application. And once we had that separated out and we had everything split out into like libraries and objects and and sane modules in Node, then it, it was actually pretty easy to just rip out all that Electron code and make it essentially its own Node package that you could then import and just wrap in Electron. And once we had that, then it was pretty much as simple as now we have the way to start it with Electron, and now we have a way to start it as just a Node package. Many late nights seeing those pull requests coming through on GitHub and uh, see Alex doing 30 <laughs> file changes across GitHub, all safe ones that are just kind of changing import paths and handling circular dependencies, but saw some some major things roll through, so it was cool to see in action. Yeah, and and now that that'll be out with 1.3, that actually opens the door for, uh, I know a lot of the work that you've been putting in uh, specifically to kind of empower our enterprise customers that right now don't have the greatest value, but value proposition um, and try to bring them more power. So why, why don't you share a little bit of what you've been building out on that side. Definitely. Yeah. So 
internally as a team, as you know, Alex and Chris know, our goal here is to create value every six weeks. And so we work in these six week blocks we call a PSI. I'll have to do a podcast about that sometime. And so on, on these kind of uh, six week blocks that we work on, we set goals at the beginning and we set kind of objectives that we want to achieve. And we make sure that they are things that are tied to end results for customers. And so what we were doing this time around is we wanted to provide more and better ways to facilitate multi-team red team operations. And so you're not an individual in this case, you're, you're working within a team, especially in the, the COVID era, you're working very separate from people in a lot of cases. And so how can you actually do a red team operation with your teammates who are anywhere around the world? And if you've been on a red team operation in a manual sense, you're probably used to what I'm used to, which is a three to five person team, one person's driving the boat essentially behind the keyboard. And then you've got three people behind him that are just watching them type in keystrokes and one person at a time gets behind the keyboard and, and does the work. And that's really not a great environment for most security assessments. There's a couple of tools out there that have been you know, trying to go toward that kind of team server type of environment to allow more people to work at the same time. And so we wanted to provide that team environment through operator but you know, after scanning around what is out in the, the tools today, we wanted to kind of follow our typical ethos, which is simplicity. What is the most simplistic way that we can allow people to do this where it just like makes sense, it's natural. And oftentimes that means it's, it's hard for us on the back end because we have to do all of the complexity and figure out how to actually make it simple for people. And so as we were doing this, it became really natural. Actually, uh, Lewis and I, another one of the engineers here, uh, we were having a conversation, you know, several weeks back and seeing some of the work Alex was doing out of headless, we came to the conclusion after kicking it around, we're like, why don't we use headless? I think we can actually leverage that to do this team sync. And so what we came up with was a mechanism from within operator to deploy a headless binary, just the flat normal one that you're going to see in 1.3 out on a redirector, which is just a small Linux server that you can deploy inside of operator. And we deploy that out, you have a, a headless application running, and then anybody on your team that wants to connect to that headless operator can, with just a one button press, you enter in a password and, and click connect, and then everybody links up to that headless, and what occurs is a bi-directional gRPC channel between all of the instances. Essentially, it's a mesh C2, and the really cool thing with that is once you all connect, as an agent comes in and connects to any one of your C2s, including the headless one, the agent is actually going to sync in real time through these bi-directional channels. So everybody sees the agent at the exact same time and everybody has the same ability to mutate the agent you Can send instructions to it. You can change its configuration. You can you know, send attacks to it. Anything you want, it's as if that agent is connected directly to your operator, but everybody has the ability to do it at the same time. That's awesome. I, I for one, am very excited to be playing with that. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for it to roll out because we've, we've had in 1.2 and prior, we've had kind of a, a pseudo version of it with our cloud plugin where you can deploy redirectors. And then we have something we call the switchboard plugin, which allows you to deploy a binary on the redirector that you can use for sharing or not really sharing, but changing which port an agent is connected to. And that allows you to kind of pass an agent back and forth between instances but only one person at a time can kind of drive the boat again. And so that's where in 1.3 is going to be like, hopefully open up this whole like Pandora's box of mesh C2 out there. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, just something for, for the listeners that it isn't readily apparent and might not be super obvious is the security team, which is myself and Chris, we don't actually on day-to-day -day develop the platform of operator. We, we do support, obviously we follow the code, but a lot of these features like, They'll build them in and then kick it over to Chris and I, and we consider ourselves customer zero. So we we are just now getting to try this stuff out, you know, a week or two before it's actually going to be going into production. And now that it's it's all settled, so we're very excited about this, and we imagine that everybody's going to be excited about this once they get to play with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love that actually. By our method, we've kind of worked this out just ad hoc, I think. But yeah, getting the the pre-release stuff to you guys on the security team. You know, a few weeks ahead of time to toy around and offer opinions and feedback before anybody else sees it, I think is actually works really well for us on the platform side too. <laughs> Imagine that <laughs> working well as a team. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited for what 
what headless is going to bring and um yeah it's going to open up so many more doors uh, especially the team collaboration par- uh, part um i think a lot of people are really going to be excited for that yeah i'll toss in one more thing because alex you had mentioned you know we're, we're really pushing on some of these more team-based and enterprise type of features mm-hmm. and really adding some some value proposition there and so you definitely have to check out, obviously, the release notes on this as, as I'm actually working on the pre-release uh, today. A um, couple of things hopped out to me that are you know, more of like uh, smaller things than obviously a Teemo, but are worth noting things like the ability to now create your own customized reports on what we call HQ, login.prelude.org, which is kind of your own personal dashboard. You actually head there and you can create your own reports of your aggregate data and share them with your teammates only you know, essentially private secure versions of your reports. That's a pretty cool thing we're rolling in, as well as the ability to essentially manage your organization in a much smoother way within that HQ environment. So you'll see some of those kind of cool features rolling into uh, the app into production along with 1.3. Uh, we're already kind of talking about it, but this is actually a pretty good segue into uh, like how we how we approach our engineering efforts in general and kind of the the thoughts we put into it from a software engineering best practices perspective. I know you have a lot of opinions on this, David, (laughs) as as we've discussed in our time together. And I know um, I wrote down two notes here, two books that you and I both, both very much like to follow and refer back to. We have uh, clean code by Robert C. Martin and uh, refactoring, improving the design of existing code by Martin Fowler. Um, Without explicitly jumping into those books, uh, you want to, talk a little bit about how we approach our engineering efforts? Yes, uh, I would love to talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) We approach it really different. You know, I've worked at a number of organizations between software and security, and we definitely do things quite different than I'd say the the typical shop does. And I I would probably sum it up with the the term simplicity and minimalism. That really is kind of how we approach things. And so we try to keep our code base very small, very tight, and very intentional. And so these are some of the, the kind of principles that we follow is like the greater, you know, greater principles that we try to follow. And so we have a, an incredibly small number of lines of code when it comes to operator. If you were to pop it open, you're going to see maybe in the, the 6,000 lines of code type of range, which is incredibly small if you're familiar with a project of, of this size and, and capability. Um, but we also use an incredibly small number of libraries. So a lot of projects will naturally do things like, you know, we have, it's an electron app operator is, so we have node libraries and those tend to be pretty large and a developer thinks nothing of adding a library for cron, a library for, you know, uh, regex and and you just kind of tack these in all of a sudden you've got 30, 40, 50 libraries. And we actually look at those very carefully and we say, we make, I I put everybody kind of through the ringer, I think on these and it's like, do we really need that? What, is it, what are we actually doing there? Can we write it ourselves? And that helps us keep our, our libraries down, which is good from not just a minimalist type of perspective, but it's also great from a security perspective because every dependency you take is a risk. You're absorbing the risk of whatever that dependency author is, whoever that dependency author is. And so th- those are kind of our high level uh, principles from the software engineering we, saw, we, we try to follow. And then underneath those big principles, I think we tend to follow a lot of the things that Alex is bringing up from, from these two like really solid books, by the way, Clean Code and Refactoring. And, and we really follow those kind of smaller principles as we do these little iterations through the code base to make everything better, features and bug fixes. So what do you think, Alex? What is a, uh, what's a code pattern that you think that we're, we tend to do, I'd say, in Operator? Ooh, that's a tough one. I know, I would say it's less a code pattern for us. It's more a... Uh, a challenge that we've we've kind of always unspoken and sometimes spoken put for each other, which is can you make your pull requests net negative across the board? That's always been at least my goal when I'm pushing code into operators. How can I add a feature but somehow make it diminish the overall number of code or number of lines of code? And that has led to actually some pretty interesting solutions that we've come up with. Like um, on our back end, for example, we were when we were looking at different ways to, via the pl- cloud plugin, for example, provision across multiple different cloud environments, there's, you know, we could do individual libraries like grab Boto3 for AWS, grab the uh, Google Cloud library and Azure library and so on and so on. Uh, or 
go grab libcloud D. And we were able to basically have the number of of co lines of code needed to provision things by just using kind of one software package. But I, that philosophy in general, right, there's tons of those vignettes. I think that's one that we as a team really push hard on. That's a challenge I'd put out for everybody. If you're working on an existing software program, you know, an, ex an existing source code base, you should look to see if every pull request you make can reduce lines, not add lines. And most, most teams I've done this sort of challenge on, uh, I think it's kind of crazy. Like, how do you add a feature and remove lines of code? And it really comes down to your ability to do two things. It's can you figure out the most optimal, efficient way to add your code? Because if you do, you can often reduce and refactor existing code that can suit the needs of your new feature and just reduce that code in order to squeeze your feature in. And you can reduce the lines, but then you can also do it through following the Boy Scout rule, which is something you'll read about in Clean Code, I believe it's in there, uh, which is kind of the Boy Scout rule of leaving a campground in better shape than you found it. We believe that with the source code, every time you touch the source code, if you're going to add something to it, you need to leave it in a better shape than you found it. And to do that, you often have to reduce some code, either that or kind of unwind some complexity, but both of those kind of go hand in hand. What about you, Chris? What have you noticed about the operator code base? Um, so, I mean, obviously it, it, you, I've only been here for a few months. So in looking at the code, mm -hmm. like it, it is quite clean, right? Uh, there, obviously there, there's that instance every so often where you find it's like, we need to get something out quickly and, but we tend to refactor quite quickly as well. So, um, that's what I've noticed. And, and I really wanted to bring up, uh, what, uh, you talked about with dependencies, um, uh, because, um, it's so important today that you really have to think about the dependencies you have in your code. If, if you, if, if you end up putting something in there that is maybe not supported very well, or tends to get supported a lot, uh, very quickly, um, it's still on you if there's sec security vulnerabilities within that. Right. And, um, it was such a, a, a mind bending thing, like, you know, uh, what was it? Probably six months ago, I was reverse engineering some SCADA uh, devices, and the there was obviously vulnerable software libraries that they were using, and you'd bring that up to the vendor, and they just did not care because they said, "Oh, it's just this library. We don't we don't deal with that. We don't we don't write for that, so it doesn't matter." But it does matter, and um, and you have to take responsibility for that. And so if you are willing to trust the libraries that you put into your code. Like, uh, that's a big deal. But at the same time, the best way to trust is to do sometimes you roll your own. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know this, Chris, but uh, a couple months ago, we published a blog. Um, I know Alex knows this because we actually did it. I can see right, right behind you. We did it in that room. Uh, we published a blog on... Um, publishing all of our dependencies. We actually put a blog up and we just listed all of operators dependencies and said like, this is what we have. If you're using operator in your environment, like this is what we're using. You should be aware as a customer of this product, like the risk that we're taking on with our dependency list. And like, if you notice anything, you don't like one of them, you think we're taking undue risk, talk to us. Like we will work with you. We will work with the code and, and try to reduce that risk as much as possible. We're also not gonna hide it from you. Uh, we want you to be right there with us. Yes, one of the things that I used to used to do, it's, it's become a pretty popular attack, I think, which is if you have a significant amount of time, whether you're doing something in the more offensive cyber operation side or something on a longer term red team operation, which is you can take a software dependency. I used to do this a lot with PIP, with Python's you know, package library. And I used to take PIP libraries and hone them myself put one up that an organization is likely to start using, make it available to them. If you've got a year or two, this works really well, and you can get a software engineering team to start using your own library. And a lot of times you'll pick something that is really, really easy. Like cron is a phenomenal one because a lot of people search for this and it just becomes a search engine optimization type of deal. If you can get people to find your library before other ones that have been out for a couple of years, you can win. And engineers, especially security people, never really care about SEO. So you can usually beat people on that when you're talking about package, you know, getting packages to the top of the list. And you can just get people to trust you over a course of a year, 18 months. And once they trust you, then you can slip a vulnerability into your 
library that gives you any sort of access, even RCE. And if you do that, as soon as they upgrade from, you know, version 1.1.3 to 1.1.4, you know, nobody, nobody notices that. And all of a sudden you get RCE in how many environments and it's a phenomenal way. And as long as you've got the time to pull it off, you can, you can really take advantage of people. And most engineers are not paying attention to the versions and especially the code within the dependency. So it'll run unnoticed most of the time. Yeah, that happened like a week ago, actually, October 22nd, the uh, user agent parser JavaScript library. Uh, they, I just pulled this up because we were talking about it in our channel. <laughs> It gets between 6 million and 7 million weekly downloads, according to its NPM page. And that impacts Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Slack. Like, the list goes on and on and on. And this is this is an insanely popular, well-used, everybody uses it, and it still got popped. So it's out there. It's yeah. happening. <laughs> well, this is one of the things that our, our platform team doesn't know yet, so don't tell them. It's uh, one of these days in the very near future, one of the responsibilities of the platform team here at Prelude is going to be following every dependency that they want to take on within <laughs> and knowing we're going to have a list, knowing who wrote it, who's the author of the dependency or authors, and it will be somebody's job on the platform team to follow the code base, to read the entire code base of the dependency and to follow every update that they want to take in order to make sure that the code is personally va validated. And that, that helps us reduce the number of dependencies because nobody's going to want that job. Yeah, that sounds miserable. <laughs> I think we've beat the uh, engineering horse to death here. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, David, for joining us today. I think we're going to let you sign off. I know you have a lot of important things that you need to go accomplish today. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate being the first guest on the podcast. And I'm actually going to pop off and find Lewis where we are putting the final finishing touches on testing team, hopefully uh, getting out here pretty quickly. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. So we're going to continue on. Um, Chris has been working on some pretty awesome stuff on the, the TTP front. I don't know if you saw last week's release, but if you want to talk about it real, real quick here, Chris. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, dive into some of the current TTPs we've been releasing. So uh, yeah, so uh, before this last release, I released some updates to Bigger, um, just doing some uh, persistence type stuff, and then also um, adding a uh, agent elevation uh, for Numa EX. And then uh, this last week, um, I uh, decided I was going to take some time off of Bigger to uh, get some more ideas, some juices flowing. And uh, <laughs> thought, well, you know, what would be a, what would, like, for a whole week there, I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And um, so I didn't want to do anything Windows related because I was like, eh, I just don't want to deal with that right now. And everybody at the office was super excited about Mac OS X. And the new Mac MacBook releases. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, maybe I'll do something Mac related. And then I was like, ah, I don't really want to deal with that either. Uh, and so I was like, you know what? I've been working a lot on Linux lately. Um, and uh, I, I've fully converted my entire desktop to, to just Linux. And I don't think I'm ever going to go back, maybe. <laughs> and so I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I'll look to see what vulnerabilities have been uh, pushed in the last uh, year. So this year, um, what what vulnerabilities uh, CVEs have been um, uh, have been pushed over on the Linux side? And so I saw this really really cool privesque. Uh, so it's CVE 20, 2021, uh, 33909, which is Sequoia. And so I I you know I was like all right I like. Let me see if I can't get this working. I think I may have told you, I was like, I'm going to give this a day, see if I can get this working. And if I can, that's great. If not, I'll pivot and I'll do some like Docker stuff or something, uh, which completely did not age well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you're not familiar with Sequoia, Sequoia basically leverages a vulnerability within the Linux kernel. So it's like, Three one three point one six to like five point one three, and 
there's been some weird car- kernel like variations after 5.13 point something but usually it's 5.13 point four um and what this does is it restricts um doesn't properly restrict a, a, a buffer allocation within uh, what they call SEQ files. And so what these SEQ files normally contain are like slashes. And so you make these, uh, basically you make the, the file name this huge slash variation. And you do this many, 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 many times. We're talking a one gig of nesting of these uh, SEQ files. And then you do a, um, uh, you basically mount this um, this directory structure, so it's proc self mount info, and then that will push you into root user, and it's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it like does like an integer overflow, it does an out of bounds rewrite. Uh, it's it's such a cool vulnerability, and uh, so like I basically. Uh, took took on a lot <laughs> to see if I couldn't get it working, um, and uh, Mon or Tuesday. So I, I I said this to Alex. I was gonna work on this on Monday, and like uh, Friday at you know six or seven o'clock at night, I think I was cursing at myself because I was like, why did th- why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> why did I not like why did I try to get this working? So like, there's a lot of um, so. Uh, when this when when this was published, um, there was quite a bit of of um, um, uh, parameters that you had to meet in order to get this working that weren't necessarily like they were published, but they were published in in multiple different areas, and so you had to like put all these things together to realize like oh yeah this is what you have to do, and so each time it would just fail and fail, and so like if you don't have enough uh, RAM for instance, but you have all the rest of the parameters, it will just basically it it, it crashes your OS and. <laughs> It doesn't even rebounce your OS. It just crashes it. And like in a VM, it's really, really cool because, um, you know, I'm running on, on KVM and QMU. And so it crashes the OS and like it does this huge, awesome like memory dump uh, that 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 does a whole printout. And it's so cool. So, yeah, like the, the VM completely crashes. Um, and so... Uh, Tons of different parameters there, uh, but it took me like I don't know forty or something odd VMs, and uh, eventually I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we try to make this uh, this uh, chain of TTPs much easier for people. Um, I noticed on Twitter most of the people that tried to do this when it was originally uh, released uh, had issues trying to get it to run. And I think a lot of that had to do with a lot of the parameters. Some people said that you needed five gigs, but really what that means is that you need five gigs free. Um, and so if you don't have mm. five gigabytes of RAM free, then uh, you tend to have a situation where the box will try to bounce. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we, we made it a little bit easier for people to be able to do. We check for kernel settings. We check your kernel version. Uh, we check your RAM. Um, and so this other big part is inodes. And so inodes is really uh, something that I learned doing this. Um, so inodes is like how your computer uh, determines how many files you can have on a computer. Um, so inodes is interesting in that uh, inodes uh, is determinate based on the... Uh, file system that you use. So, like, say if you're on Ubuntu and you use just the their standard um, uh, file system, which gives you like EX4 or something like that. Um, basically, like for one inode, it requires 15 kilobytes. So you need like 30 or something odd uh, gigabytes of available, like the setup your if you're setting up a, a target machine to try this on, you need like 30 something odd gigabytes uh, just to get the amount of inodes available. So when we do, a, so in the TTP, there's a DF-I um, that you do. And so that will tell you how many inodes that you have on a specific um, uh, directory. So 
you need to be able to launch this with an available inode of 1 million plus. <laughs> so it has to make a million plus. So what that's saying is that you need to make, you're going to end up making a million plus folders. Um, and so that would give you the one gigabyte plus of, 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 uh, uh, of deletion that you'll make on these folders when you do the, um, uh, the mount. So, uh, it's a really cool vulnerability. Highly encourage everyone to go check it out. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, hopefully, we'll, so we'll try to make this a little bit easier, uh, along the way as well. I'll, I'll end up probably refactoring this a little bit, but yeah, um, that's what I've got going on for current TTP releases. Alex, I know you have something really cool that you've been working on as well. So yeah, w what I've been investigating actually alongside, uh, one of our customers is uh, in interesting in different ways to use the operator platform in general. So one of the use cases that we're specifically investigating is using the cloud plugin, provisioning out a Linux VM, and then having that, that agent that gets beacon backed be essentially your, your staging server for all your capabilities that you would want to use um, on like your standard Kali attack box. So standing up a chisel server, standing up... Uh, other kind of proxying mechanisms if you want to stand up like an HA proxy or whatever. And then using that box as a staging ground for all of your attacks into a target network. And it starts to step into the initial access and uh, let people do a little bit of the stuff that you can't necessarily do if you don't already have a foothold in the network. Uh, so if you wanted to, for example, use that agent deployed out on a Linux VM and then have uh, a series of TTPs that are essentially your resource development TTPs, sudo app get install Metasploit, for example, uh, and then you could have TTPs for that agent that would do um, Nmap scans or uh, potentially throw remote exploits or the list goes on, essentially. And then in an entirely separate range, you have your, um, your agents that are actually in a target network. And using a combination of that staging range and your actual target range, you can now do much more advanced stuff like uh, SOX proxying, um, pivoting data from your agents out to that particular box as opposed to pivoting the data directly back to operator. Um, exfilling to that target, or or um, the list goes on. Uh, I don't want to completely reveal all the things that we're working on, uh, but the idea is to get away from just that standard uh, beaconing implant coming beaconing, or I guess reverse shell implant coming back directly to operator. Uh, how can you be more creative with that? So that's an area that we've been investigating and we're going to continue to investigate and, and how can we facilitate that kind of operation for users in our ecosystem. So I don't want to spoil like your, your blog post that you're about to post, but I think this sort of kind of goes into the, the blog post a little bit where, uh, you know, we're working with customers and this all came from working with a customer and talking with them. And yeah, like this idea came about and we're just like, yeah, We'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. He, you know, there's, there's something that uh, you, a lot of our pro license holders may or may not know is if you message us, hey, can we have a one-on-one -on -one video call? The answer is going to be yes. Um, and if you want to do that every day for a week, the answer is going to be yes. We're, we're here to support that. And the reason we do that kind of stuff is there are use cases that we just can't conceive of. And seeing those use cases and talking through them with customers helps us build you better products. So if, if you're listening and you are a pro license holder or, or even a community member and you're like, hey, I have this weird edge case that you guys don't currently handle. Can, can you help me with this? I'm super interested to hear about that use case. Yeah, like that's one of the big things I think that our... I mean, our company offers, but that we offer from our tool perspective that uh, a lot of other companies are not offering, right? Like that one-on-one -on -one customer experience, um, it really goes uh, a long way. So uh, if you're a customer out there with a pro license, utilize us. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> We're there. <laughs> DM me. <laughs> um, so uh, I think uh, this is a good segue to talk about uh, some of the new uh, or upcoming uh, content stuff that we'll be dropping. Um, so we have uh twitch stream so we did a twitch stream if you're not familiar we, we did a twitch stream uh two weeks ago um and we did some really cool stuff of just basically doing some on the fly software development uh and uh so if you haven't checked that out definitely check it out it's like four hours long so uh but it's on youtube um i don't think we have it we i don't think we have it staged to, to twitch um uh, but we'll we'll definitely um uh, have uh, links to all the stuff that we'll talk about today in the description. Um, so yeah, we'll do another Twitch stream here in a week. So it's November 10th. So it's on Wednesday. Um, and then uh, we have a blog post that I'll be posting out next Monday on Sequoia. Uh, and then um, we have... Uh, our next TTP release, which is next Tuesday, Alex. That's going to be what Alex just talked about. Um, that will be on that release, mm-hmm. and then uh, our next podcast will be next month. So we do these podcasts every month. If you're not familiar, and so uh, our next podcast will be next month uh, at the last Friday of the month. So, um, will that be a Thanksgiving podcast? I'm not sure. Is th- no Thanksgiving's the Second to last, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So that that I think that will be the, it'll be close to Thanksgiving. We'll figure it out. Maybe maybe we'll record a little bit earlier and then uh, and still send it out on the Friday. So if uh, maybe it'll be a uh, after turkey dinner podcast. <laughs> that oh you'll man. Listen to. <laughs> the falling asleep podcast is what we'll call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, uh, lots of content, uh, that we're going to be pushing out to everybody. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. If you, uh, if you do enjoy it, definitely, uh, give us a like and subscribe, uh, so that that way you don't miss any of, uh, the content drops that we do. We try to give it everybody as much time as possible to at least see our Twitch streams, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, uh, definitely, um, look forward to all the content drops we're about to do. Um, we'll also include all the links to the uh, the various books and resources that we talked about during this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I think uh, that concludes our Overture podcast for this month. We'd like to thank you for uh, giving us a listen. We know that there's tons of podcasts out there. Um, if you do enjoy our podcast, please uh, consider subscribing to us. And with that, Prelude out.